I was asked to speak a little bit or to give as much, a little bit of chizuk to our people, to our Yidin in these troubled times. Would you believe, all that are listening, that since we came in 1965, we had lived through eight wars, not less than eight wars, not all of them directly hitting Yerushalayim, but all of them against Eretz Yisrael. And my father, Rabbi Scheinberg, would give us chizuk, and he would tell us to remember that HaKosh Baruch Hu, in his chesed, though there's days of din and gzeirot kashot, hard gzeirot, there's also rachamim and chesed. And it's kedai for us to realize that these are made for us to help us until Hashem, in His Chesed and in His Rachamim, that He has in such abundance, will take away the Gzeus. I like to talk about when things are tough, are tough, we have for Hashem three toughs to help us. Shuva, I'm talking to all of you, you're all firm. But like my father says, we're all Balei Tshuva from the day we're born, we have 120 years to grow. And Shuva is not more than the ability to grow and be more hush, more special. Like it says, Hashem chose us, we're special people. The Yidin are Hashem's special children. So. We have, Baruch Hashem, three beautiful tufts, also a tuft. When things are tough, three tufts. Tshuva, like I just said, Tefillah, and Tikva. I'd like to talk a little bit, since Tshuva, we're going to have, we're all, like you say, trying our best. And Tshuva will be very, 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 very relevant in just a little while because Elo is right, right coming up very, very shortly. I'd like to talk a little more about Tefillah because as, as a woman, it's, it's, it's so confident. It's so, it's there. How far are we from a sitter? How far are we from a Tehillim? I'd like to share a story that gave me and meant a realization of how Tefillah starts and grows. From a Mechutin of mine who never went through the war in Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a famous never Nazi work camp. He said that they were cruel, the Nazis, and they made, they, rough, they woke the people at nine, at seven in the morning. They started to work two hours later. Why would you work, woke up, wake up all the camp, all Nebuch, the Yidden, so very early? Their day was so long and so hard. They wanted, apparently, to weed out I'll just go back a wee bit and start again because we had a little disturbance. We had, my, my Mechutin was taken to Buchenwald in 1939 because he was a German citizen from Leipzig, a Yid, and they started with their own country. He said that in this work camp that he was taken to Buchenwald, they woke the entire camp, work camp, at seven in the morning. Why seven? They started to work close to nine o'clock. Why, why wake the entire camp to a day that was so long and so heavy and so burdensome? They needed their strength 
They were given so little food. But they had a plan, a fiendish plan. To wake them early, they would find out who is weak, who is sick, who has given up hope. They will fall. They cannot stand in the cold. They have no clothes suitable for such weather. Remember that there were no stores to shop in. What they came with, that's what they had. Or what the Germans left under the fence. Old clothes, mostly tattered, mostly schmattes. Rags were left there. Even that, like you say, was done with cruelty. So many fell. They were either sick or they were despairing of ever getting out. And they felt maybe an, an, a, a death, death, how bad it is, is preferable to living like this. Many fell and they, caught, they would collect them, put them, pack them into a, uh, cars, go-karts, or a, a piece, you know, uh, uh, additions, additions to the cars that they like, you know, they, I don't know what you call those, U-Hauls, U-Hauls added to the cars and take them to the crematoriums. There was there in the camp in Buchenwald, a man in his fifties, a rough. And in the evening he spoke and he said to pass on the message that he has an eight sin. He says, Yidin, Hashem helps that Yidin always find a way. I have an idea and it's going to give us chizuk. Instead of just standing and waiting for us to start the work, we're going to do something very different. We're going to pray. We're gonna daven. Why do we have to stand for two hours just like, like you say, rob, robotic, robots? Like a goy, like goylem, like, like a goylem stands without doing anything. We'll daven. We'll say Kedusha. Kedusha is anyway said when you stand. And that will help for us to feel that we're at least doing something. We're asking the Rabbanish Lord. We're turning to him. He's our good Tati in him. He's our good Father in heaven. We'll turn to him and he will not, like you say, not listen to our Tfilah. There is never a Tfilah. We should remember and remember and remember. Never a Tfilah that goes to waste. Every tefillah reaches the Shammai. Every tefillah min from the heart. Hashem listens to me. And so we started to say Kedusha. And we said it once and we said it twice. Many were not from, they were hidden, that were in the lines. But Hitler was not very careful or caring if they were not all from. He didn't care. If you had Jewish blood, you were taken into the camps. That was the only, like you say, the, the condition that determined if you were going to the camp, Jewish blood. Well, people started to think, you know, Hashem is up here. Hashem is here. What do we know? The ones that were from felt so good. Kedusha gives a lift. It's 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 a, like you say a heilige tefillah. It's a tefillah that that turns to the banish lelam and helps us to realize that we're spiritual, not just physical. We have an neshama, and a neshama will carry, like it says, the ruach adam. 
Isa et Kufo et Mahala will come, will give us the strength to bear all that the body suffers. The Neshama keeps us going. And this is a tefillah that's coming from our Neshama. And so they say, and people didn't fall. The sick felt begin to get better. The ones that were tired said, Hashem, give strength. The ones, instead of giving up, that were despairing or depressed, said, what? Let's look ahead, not, not what's now can pass. Hashem can help. And everyone took from this Kedusha tremendous chizuk. They said it for two, almost two hours. And the people did not fall. The sick, like I said. Now the Germans started to wonder what's going on. How could it be? How could it be? No one's falling. No one's sick. No one's giving up. No one's so tired. No one's... Ah. And they came to tell it to the commandant. Well, the commandant was a doctor by profession. And he couldn't understand there was no, no extra food given, no, no, like it's a lightening of their burden, no blankets, warmer blankets, nothing was given, no benefits. Why are they all of a sudden standing straight and, and remaining in the lines. And then they asked. They started to ask, and they came. Of course, one was Malshin, and he said, there's a rabbi that told us to pray. They laughed at first. Ha! If you pray, why don't you pray to get out of here? Why don't you pray to be saved? Why don't you pray that your God sh should send someone to help you? The, the comments that, uh, that Goyim have made to all of Atzaris and all of Golas. We're not, we're not surprised to hear them say it. We're used to the Goyim saying it. They always questioned and tried to weaken us. But we remained, like you say, Mami Nim, Nei Mami Nim. However, they did take this rov to the commandant. And the commandant said to him, you know that tomorrow you will be shot in front of the whole camp. And what do you say to that? You're not allowed, you're not allowed to rebel. We don't want to rebel in here. The rabbi said, I, we only pray. The evening is our time. It doesn't take away from you. It doesn't take, like you say, we do not lessen our, our work during the day. Why are you so upset? He said, nothing here in this camp is to be done except eat, to have the strength, eat and sleep, to have the strength to work. That's all. Have I said to him, you say that tomorrow you will kill me in front of the camp. I want to tell you that you'll have another dead carcass on your, on your, on your ground. Another dead body. But the spirit, you'll never kill. Spirit is spirit. As the neshama by us is spiritual. You deal only with bodies, only with the physical. You cannot take us away from us on the shaman. And that remains. And though you may hurt and harm, the spirit of a Jew will be, always will live. We will never give up hope. We will never give in. Because the Neshama will keep us going. And on the shaman is something you cannot touch or harm. The commandant looks at him and says, you're not afraid? You're not afraid of death? 
and the rabbi says, you call this living? <laughs> no, because we're not afraid of death. You see, we don't die, and the shaman never dies. We pass on to a better world. then says, how I envy you. I'm afraid of death. I hate you because you're a Jew, but I envy you your faith. I do not have that. You know what happened? The next day the guards walked up and down the rows of Jews standing. They wanted them to stop praying. And the rabbi was not touched. Something in what the rabbi said convinced the commandant that this is a phenomenon he can't, he can't understand. There's some power here that he cannot fight. The rabbi was never killed. When Maimon was freed in 1945 at the end of the war, so was the rabbi. He survived the entire time at Bukhub. That's one story I wanted to share with you about Tuma. I wanted also to share with you another story that perhaps is more appropriate, like you say, for the ladies. Not really, but also in a different vein. Maybe because it also took place in the mirror where I lived for the first four years of my life. It talks about the librarian in the mirror. She was a Yesayme. She studied at the university because she was left a very young orphan with a mother to support. She became a librarian and she was the librarian in the mirror and in the surrounding town. The farmers, for the farmers, for the surrounding areas. She was at this point 28 years old and it was era of Rosh Hashanah and she was very, very unhappy. All her friends were married. All her friends had families. And she was still single, without only with a mother to support. Not only a mother is special, but it didn't seem to help her with the shidduch. And she was very depressed. She said, look, no one comes to the library at Anna Rosh Hashanah. Not a time that they're thinking of books. It was quiet and she sat down to write a letter. She said, let me at least write a letter to the baby Shlela. I don't have whom to talk to. My mother is so brave, always encouraging me. I cannot burden her with my, with my, with my tsar. The baby Shlela, though, has a heart big enough for all of Klai Yisrael. To him, I'll write the letter. And so she starts to write. Hatbenish Leilam, who gave me so much, <coughs> gave me health, who gave me a special, wonderful, inspiring mother, who gave me a job, but I didn't yet get a host. What should I say? I may be too fussy, maybe I ask for too much Hashem. That's why I'm writing you from my heart. Do I ask too much? I want a Ben Torah. I got a, 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 a shatran offered me the wagoneer. He drives the wagon to the train. He offered for me. He asked me to marry him. I said, I have to think about it but I don't want to marry him. I want a bento. The one who fixes is the tailor, the one who cleans the clothes in the, 
in our shadow mirror. He offered for me. I said no. Maybe I'm too particular. Am I asking too much, Hashem? If I want to bend taller, please try to give me an answer. I need clarity of mind to know what to do, whether to give up and marry just a nice Eurasia Mayim, a good boy with nice me dog. And after all, I have a mother to take with me to my home. Maybe it's just enough to settle and give up on my dream of a bento. Pray, I pray that you answer me. Somehow you give me the clarity of mind to know what to do. All my sincerest caring and devotion to you, Hashem, your loving daughter, let's call her Sarah Miriam. I took the letter. I wrote La Abashali Bashamayim to my father in heaven. And I let the, the wind carry my letter. I was on the right outside the library, a little walk, few a few blocks down. The country roads were, like you say, started. Just the outskirts of, of Mir and I let the, la the letter blow away. A few days after she wrote this letter, a boy from the Miri Yeshiva decided to take a little bit of walk outside the boundaries of Mir and the country roads for some fresh air. He was going to a hard sukya in the Gemara and he had a headache. Maybe the air would clear his head. It would feel better. And as he walked a little bit out of the city, city limits, he saw an envelope in a bush. An envelope in a bush? How does an envelope come here? And he picked it up. And he says, La, la bashali bashamai. What is this letter? What could it be? He opened it and he read the letter. He went back to the yeshiva and he said to the mashkiach, Kvod mashkiach, I found this letter. It touched me very deeply. I'd like to meet this girl. Mashkiach said to him, oh no, she's the assignment she has a mother that you will have to take care of. No father to give a nidunya. No money comes with this maidama. It's a pity, but you want to grow in Torah. You're such a special family. You have a future ahead of you, and the future cannot contain this girl. She's older than you, a few years old, so. How can you, if you want to steig, how could you take a girl without an adunia, without some means of help along the way? And the mother as well? No, no, no. And he said to him, Kvoda Mashkia, Abba became, despite all you said, I'd like to meet this girl. I feel that she's a special girl. And look, she wants only a bentola. Probably she's willing with Messiris Netesh to let me learn. One never knows money is in the hands of the Rabbeinish Lela. He has much money to give. But the Messiris Netesh comes from us for a life's, a Torah lifestyle. And that she wants. I want to meet her. He met her. He was impressed, and they were married. He eventually, you should know, became a mashgiach in Minsk, and among his Talmudim that he had was Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, one of the Dolei Hador, Rav Rudamin. Many Doilim passed through his hands. 
have we a right to tell someone, I ask you all, to question Hashem's answer to every tefillah? There are so many happy endings, so many answers. Sometimes we only have to wait a bit, and sometimes we just have to believe. Because Hashem never turns aside a tefillah. I had a little time, and I thought that maybe I would add a story of that hope. I think you all know my aunt, Rebbe Tushem, and I'm sure I'm talking to many ladies. This is meant for ladies, and you would like to hear my aunt's story. It's a story that happened also in the mirror. My aunt had just had a baby. My aunt, my Zadie, who you all know from all for the boss, Yaakov Yosef her. Then my aunt to the mirror with my uncle Meshe Moshe to learn. There were very few yeshivot in America, and the ones that were, both my father and my uncle had already studied there. And so my Zadie, who did so much for Klai Yisrael, and Askin Godel, a big Askan, he sent them to the baby. She had this baby, and the baby was born in the mirror. A name for the Chovetz Chaim, who had just died a few years before, Israel Meir. The delivery was very difficult because there was only a Mialedet, a midwife. She had hands of gold, but she couldn't cut or operate, and the baby was very big. And the baby tore my aunt badly, but that was not the problem. The head came out first, yes, but the shoulders were stuck, and it was many hours before the midwife was able to, to turn and twist and, like you say, help get the child out. The child was a healthy boy. A strong yingale was big, too. That's why there was such difficulty. And my aunt, though, became sick because the conditions in, in, the, in the house were not as sterile as the hospital. And for, because of so many hours and so much, so much, like you say, time passed, and on, like you say, on the bed that she was giving birth to, what, do, what could we have done to prevent germs from passing in the house, there's always germs. It's not a sterile the house, the bed is sterile, but the house is not. And my aunt became paralyzed from the waist down. She got blood poisoning, and that's what it caused her. She could not move her limbs from the waist down. The days passed, there were sad days in the mirror. Everyone felt so bad for my aunt. And one day, when my, as my uncle was wheeling her on, uh, in a wheelchair, she heard two women say, two young women, how, how pathetic, how sad. Look at that handsome young man with a crippled wife. It was that night that she sent for Reb Chatzko Levenstein, the Mashkiach, the famous Mashkiach Chatzko, Chatzko the Mashkiach, Reb Chatzko the Mashkiach in the mirror. He came right away. Everyone had pity on my aunt. And she was very good friends with his two daughters, Ochebet and Slatke. And he felt very close to my aunt. And he came, he came straight away. And she said, Reb Chatzko, then she didn't call him Reb Chatzko, would have been a 
big, like you say, very disrespectful. He was the the choshev of choshev of Chatzko of the mirror, the mashkia. She said, "Quote her mashkia. I want you to convince my husband to take a get. I I I I can't walk. I'm limited to a wheelchair, and I can't have more children." My, my, my special husband, Moshe, does not have to suffer. I want him to take a get. I want to give him a get. Surprisingly, though, was the reaction of the Mashkiah. He said, Ruchamale, shame on you. He scolded her. He didn't pity her, he scolded her. He said, what's wrong with you? You don't dab in right. Why don't you daven? She said, I don't daven right every minute that my Moshe is not in the house, I daven. I, I, and when he comes in, I, I just, mommy, plant a, a, a smile on my face, though my heart is broken. He doesn't, at least the atmosphere in the house should be pleasant and not depressed and gloomy. What do you mean I don't daven right? You don't daven with hope. What do you want from Hashem? She said, I, I'm, I want to be, I want, I want. I cry because I have so much sorrow. He says, what do you want? You have to hope and we realize that Hashem is there to help you. What do you want? I want to be able to bring my only child to the chuppet, walking, not in a wheelchair. That's all. That's all. You don't want more? No. That's enough. I don't want to be greedy. Hashem has a cheshbin. Hashem has a cheshbin, but he gave you also a cheshbin. He gave you a cheshbin to have, to have to, to daven. He gave you a gift. He gave you a way. To help always, to daven and to hope. Where's the hope here? She says, what should I hope for? What should I ask for? You say I should ask for more? Ask that you should dance at all your children's weddings. How can I be so greedy? You don't trust Hashem to give you? Ask the Machkiah. Are you not ashamed? Well, after he left, she said, you know, what would I lose? I should do something. If I hope, I hope, well, he's right. Why do I have to just sit? I should, if you, if you have hope, you move. It moves you, you don't just sit. And she found out that there were hot baths near Germany. And she decided that she's gonna go there to take these hot baths. They say they bring much help to people of all kinds of ailments. And little by little, she started to feel sensation in her feet there. After a few, after a few months, she started to feel sensation in her feet. The color also changed and the swelling went down. And after a while, she was able to walk. When she left the mirror, she was able to walk. But children, no. How could she dance at the children's weddings? No more children. Let Hashem help me, she said, to dance at least at Yisrael May's wedding. But no, she said, it's not right. He said, Reb Hatzkel, I should pray for the children. Maybe it's an insult of a Leila. He told me not to ask just for crumbs, to ask for a whole loaf of bread. Hashem Kim gave you a whole loaf, he asked for crumbs. That's what he said to me, crumbs? No, nah? it's an insult to a Leila. And so, I started, of course, I did. I, I, but my hope, 
I started to try harder. I took vitamins. I walked more. I started to feel maybe, maybe Hashem is the doctor of all doctors. Well, the years passed. And when I was, my Yisrael May was eight years old, I needed to go again to the doctor. There were changes in my body I did not understand. And I told him my story. I went to a big gynecologist and I told him my story. And he said, Mr. Shane, let me examine you. Without that, I cannot help you. And he examined me and said to me, Mrs. Shane, you're right, something is yes growing inside you. You see, my aunt was very well read. She had a lot of time to read, and she was always interested in medical problems and medical issues since she went through so much. I'm just that interested. She said, Doctor, what can you tell me? You are, my dear, having a baby. A baby? I don't believe you. The doctor said I cannot have any more children. Well, my dear, I don't have to prove anything. Time will prove what I'm telling you. With a big smile, the months ahead will prove that I'm right. My aunt went back, and when she told, my uncle waited impatiently to hear what the doctor had to say. They were both so worried. And the doctor, and she came and she said, Moshe, when I tell you what the doctor said, you will say to me, I don't believe you. And my uncle said to her, would I ever say such a thing to you, Rakoma? Ever, ever? Moshe, we're having a baby. I don't believe you. See? <laughs> And of course, a few months later, I had my aunt had a beautiful baby daughter. I made her. And a few years after that, another young And she danced at all their weddings. I can tell more, but I think already it's time. I have just a certain amount of time to talk. I leave you with two big messages. Messages that have proved themselves so, so sincerely and so truthfully over all our years of God. There is nothing that, that we can say regarding Tvila and Tikva to take away even one millimeter of the effect they can have on our lives. Hashem hears and helps. He's our good tat in him. And we have had only proof of it for all of, from the time that Adam was created. Like like Rev Hatzkel said, to my end. There is nothing Hashem can do. He waits for our tefillahs and our hope in Him. I leave you these two beautiful gifts. May they help each and every one of you to give what you need to help each and every one. Because like I said, we are Hashem's special kindala and he's there for us. And may he in Gichem bring the schutz of our tefillos and our hope, and our hopes. May he bring in Gichem, the Shiach Tzidkeinu, my hair, like you say, b'mheira, b'yameinu, amen.